welcome to SciGest, your fortnightly serving of digestible science from plant and food research. Hello, I'm Blue Plunkett. Welcome back to SciGest. Today we're talking about a pest insect called the brown marmorated stink bug, or Heliomorpha halis for anyone interested in uh, scientific names. And this bug keeps trying to get into New Zealand, and based on what's happened in other countries, we're pretty lucky that it has not got here yet. It's been in the news a bit too lately, um, most recently in March this year when New Zealand turned away a fourth ship due to this bug being found, which then had to be treated before it could land here. So the reason we don't want it here is because it threatens a lot of the crops grown here in New Zealand. And we wanted to find a bit more out about this bug and to let people know what to do if they find it. So we have an expert with us today, Dr. Gonzalo Avila. Thanks, Gonzalo, for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much to you, Blue, for having me here. Yeah. Um, so before we get into the, your research and, and what you're working on at the moment, how did you end up in this area and working in this field? In biological control, yeah. Everything started a few years ago when I got into New Zealand to do my postgrad studies. I did a master's in biosecurity and conservation, and uh, I did my specialization in biological control. And then I carried on doing a PhD in biological science at the University of Auckland. And I also did my uh, research on biological control. Right. And that's how I ended up working in this area here. <laughs> nice. So what was your PhD species that you were? Oh, on? yeah. Uh, I did my master's in my PhD on the same... Uh, a species, you know, I, I did my work on a parasitoid called Cotisia urabae, which is a parasitoid of a Lepidopteron pest that causes a lot of problems to eucalyptus trees. All right. And the gum leaves skeletonize us. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, interesting. The the brown marmorated stink bug, which you work on now, I guess most people would have seen the stink bug or the shield bug that mm -hmm. is already present in New Zealand, the little green veggie bug. Oh, yeah, and sh that's shield an bug. invasive one as well. Green that's invasive bug. also? Yeah. Right, right. So that one is what most people would have seen. Mm -hmm. So compared to that, what is it about the brown marmorated stink bug that makes it worse or mm -hmm. more of a worry than that one? Yeah, the problem with the brown marmorated stink bug, you know, this one is uh, severe agricultural and horticultural pest. And uh, the problem with this, the brown marmorated stink bug is that uh, it has more than a hundred different host plants reported as suitable hosts. You know, it attacks a wide range of different trees, uh, you know, also vegetables, and fruit trees, and also can be found attacking ornamental trees, like for example, you know, oaks and uh, leaky umber. Right, right. And, so. and also can attack, you know, some forestry uh, trees for like uh, pine species and and lots of others. And you know, in terms of the problems that it can cause to agriculture and horticulture, you know, it attacks a lot of different sort of things. Like you know, can attack apples, kiwi fruit, uh, different vegetables like tomatoes, soybean. Yeah. Right, so lots of the things that uh, New yeah. Zealand uh, is pretty good at growing. So yeah, exactly. A a so it, it, it could cause a really big damage. So and what what sort of damage does it do? How does it attack the plants? Yeah, the way that it attacks the plants, nymphs of the sting bug, they can attack major and uh, immature fruits, and the adults can attack fruits as well. Uh, you know, mainly uh, you know major fruits. And uh, the way that these, uh, you know, sting bugs cause the damage is they use their mouth parts, their stylet, they insert it into the plant tissues, and they start sucking, you know, fluids containing sugar and nutrients. They disfigure fruits and makes them unmarketable. So that's that's the main problem with the sting bugs. And is there anything known about if it will affect any native <coughs> species, or has anyone? Yeah. Do you know of any work that's been done around? Yeah. Native yeah, plants? it's been estimated that it would be really easy for the brown marmorated to sting back to attack uh, native plants in New Zealand because, as I said, it's been reported that way over 100 different host plant species, so it wouldn't be really difficult for the sting back to move into native plants. So, where is it originally from? Uh, well, the brown marmorated sting back is native uh, to Asia, right? Uh, more specifically to China, Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. So uh, it is native from those countries, and then it, it moved to the United States back in the mid-90s. And also, you know, it's present in lots of different countries in Europe, 
also in Canada and North America. And it was more recently found in South America last year in Chile. Right, so yeah. it's spreading around quite quite yeah. a lot at the moment. That's true. Yeah. So how, how does it get around? What What's spreading it? The most common way that, you know, you can get sting bugs spreading around the different countries is by, you know, by trade and people traveling all around the world. Because the thing is that the sting bug in winter, they start over overwintering. Mm -hmm. So they aggregate and they look for shelter, hiding in, you know, different sort of places like, you know, houses, buildings. But they also hide in other things like machinery, cars. They can, you know... You, you know, they can, uh, you know, hitchhike on, on luggage from people. So, for example, when we are importing things from any country in the Northern Hemisphere where they have different seasons from us, uh, we can start getting steam bags, uh, you know, in, in containers coming with things. Mm. And, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it spreads all around the world. Right. You know, so it's, been, it's been carried by people and, and things that we are importing. Yeah, right. So because of its winter behavior where it sort of slows down and, and hides away in, in crevices, yeah, that's it, it gets tucked in things that we're moving around. That's correct. Right. Yeah, And the way it dispersed, in, in, for example, in, in the U.S. or any country where it's present, it's, it's, it's a really good flyer as well. So, you know, it can fly really long distances and, you know, it, it also can be a bit vectored by people going from here and there, you know. It's, Right, right. So it sounds like it's got no trouble getting around. No, yeah. So what have the levels of detection in New Zealand been like in the past compared to today? Mm. Are we seeing it often? Or? Yeah, yeah. we've been uh, detecting uh, Brahmanich thing back uh, in, at the border for a few years now. But this particular year was quite alarming because we started uh, intercepting at the border sting bugs from, from September to February. And there was around 210 interceptions in this season, which comprised at around 1,500 brown marmite sting bug insects. So it was, it was pretty bad. Right, so that, that was this year's detection? That was this level. year, yeah. Right, okay, so it sounds like it's picking up a little bit. Yeah, bit which is not really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if someone finds it in their <coughs> garden or on their property... Uh, what 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 do they need to do? The, the most appropriate thing to do is like if you think that you found the brown is sting bad, mm. you have to try to catch it, take a picture, and then report it to MPI straight away. So it sounds like the bulk of the risk is to you know staple sort of horticultural and agricultural mm. crops, but does that extend very far into forestry or home gardens? And the thing is that as I said before, the main uh, host of of this piece are fruit trees and also vegetables, but um, the, the impacts that it may have, for example, to ornamental trees or uh, forest trees, it, it's been reported to be more like a cosmetic damage, so it's not really expected that it would cause like, uh, problems to the forestry industry or anything like that. But in terms of impacts on the you know, population, the problem with the brown marmot system is also a nuisance pest. You know, when, when they go to overwinter, they start aggregating in houses and they can start hiding in, you know, uh, car parks and everywhere. They can actually get into your house, you know. In, in the U.S., you know, I don't, I don't know if you've seen that there's, there's lots of pictures going around on the Internet showing really bad infestations uh, in houses. You know, you can see, you know, uh, adult steam bugs overwintering and covering the entire houses, which is something, you know, that we don't really want to have here. And apart from, from that, you know, they, they could always start causing problems to, you know, plants you got in your garden. So since mm. it's been detected in New Zealand, what have other countries done when, they've, when it's entered into their borders? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the US, you know, Brahma Wetty Stingback has been found causing a lot of damages, you know, over the years. For example, you know, in, back in 2010, in the mid-Atlantic region in the US, you know, it was found causing around 37 million losses only in the apple industry and in the same year you know it was also causing problems to other you know other industries as well and also you know in other countries it's also been found causing lots of damage for example in italy and most recently you know in georgia you now uh, the bmsp arrived in georgia uh, in 2015 and then on 2016, the next year after the, its arrival, you know, it was found causing lots of problems uh, to the agricultural systems there, more specifically to the hazelnut industry, where it was found causing damages 
between 20 and 24 million dollars. So right, been, sounds like expensive hits that industries take when it when it arrives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, do you know much about any control methods mm. and things that mm. may have been used overseas that have worked, or is, are they still being developed, or what's what's the situation? Yeah, in terms of the control method, it's not really a, a really a good control method available against the MBMSP. You know, the most the, the most common one that has been used to try to control it is uh, chemical control. You know, they've been using pesticides to try to get rid of the bugs. But the problem is that uh, <coughs> this is not a really good technique. So the most common way to control it has been the use of broad spectrum insecticides. And, and, and that's pretty bad because that, you know, it's not, a, it's not selective, so it kill, kills pretty much everything. Right, yeah. So is, do you think that mm. might be because just because of it's such a generalist mm. that we've only got sort of general ways to control it yet yeah, because of its broad range mm. and its different... Um, host plants that it attacks. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that you know, it's it's really hard to you know find like in terms of chemical applications a really good selective method method to uh, you know to control nymphs and also the adults. So it's it's, mm. it's really it's a really problematic one. Right. Yeah. Sounds like tricky yeah. to to get something that just yeah. targets the the brown mummer. Exactly. Yeah. In Italy, well, they've been using other kind of control methods uh, like they, they've been using netting. To cover, you know, for example, kiwi fruits, okay. cultures, but you know, it's it's still like a, a way to stop it a little bit, but it's not really effective, you know, because you know nymphs and, and adults can still find a way through the netting. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. So <coughs> as far as the work that you're doing around controlling it, yeah. what are you looking at? Biological to? control. Yeah. That's what we are doing here in New Zealand at this stage, and also biocontrol uh, opportunities against the stink bug have, uh, are, are being studied also overseas in the U.S. and Europe. And uh, there's a little tiny wasp that uh, is, is, is the one that has been found to be the most promising biocontrol agent. This is the, uh, the, the wasp Trisocus japonicus, and it's commonly known as the, as the samurai wasp. So the way it controls uh, the stink bug is uh, it's, this is an egg parasitoid, so what, what the, the wasp uh, do is it's looking for, you know, uh, stink bug eggs, and then, you know, uh, it parasitizes these eggs. And in China, uh, uh, well, this, this wasp is also native to China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, and uh, it's been found to be really, really effective on, on keeping population levels low. So, for example, it's been found parasitizing over 70% of brown mammoth stink bug eggs. So it's been quite a good way to control, you know, populations of stingbacks in those places. So how does it find the eggs? Is it using yeah. pheromones or do you know yeah, how it yeah. finds the nest? It, or? Yeah, it's, it's a similar way that, you know, all parasitoids, they use uh, uh, chemical volatiles to first find the habitat host and then the host. So, for example, you know, Trisocus japonicus could be, you know, flying around and would be detecting chemical volatiles to the specific habitat where the stingbugs could be. And then they start refining their search, looking for more specific chemical volatiles from, in this case, from the uh, stingbug eggs. Right, so it's like a, an odor mm. trail that it, it tracks. Pretty to. much, yeah, yeah. Right, and mm. how do you assess the, the samurai wasp mm. for its potential utility mm. to use as a biocontrol agent? Like you, yeah. you, you grow it in the lab and, and yeah. run some tests for... <laughs> What? Yeah, what we do is uh, is what we actually do for all the potential biocontrol agents to be introduced in New Zealand. We have to test for their biosafety. So what we do, we do host specificity testing and containment to make sure that the parasitoid is gonna be safe uh, for you know to be introduced in New Zealand and it's not gonna be causing any problems to other non-target species. Mm. For example. The specific specificity mm. must be an yeah. important factor. Yeah. Right. Um, so as far as New Zealand goes, how it's been detected at the border multiple times and, and sounds like it's being detected more and more often, however many has been found this year. Is it just luck that it hasn't sort of established yet? Do we have nice cold winters that it doesn't enjoy or it's just it's not luck we're, we're just seeing more of it as more exports mm. and imports <coughs> move around? Yeah, the thing is that the, the, I think that in terms of if it's lag or not, I would say that we've been doing a really good job in terms of you know monitoring and detecting the BMSP at the border, and in this case, been the role of MPI. 
They've been doing a wonderful job on keeping things away from the country. And, and in terms of the likelihood of getting BMSP here established, you know, in terms of the, you know, climate, you know, that, that wouldn't be a problem at all, you know. Not an issue for it? Not an issue for it, because uh, even though the optimal temperature for the sting bite would be around 25 degrees, eggs and, and adults can still survive at really low temperatures. Mm. It's native from China, where there's some places that are, like Beijing, for example, it gets really cold in winter. So in New Zealand, you know, for, it would be easy for BMSP to survive as well. Right, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit about your work today, Gonzalo, and hope to hear in the future that the samurai wasp can help control any more detections of this bug in New Zealand. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. If you find any brown marmorated stink bug, please call MPI on 0800 80 66. Thanks to everyone for listening. Please join us next time on SciGest, where we deliver some more digestible science from New Zealand. <laughs>